Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the talk on South Africa's war against capitalism. And really what I want to do with this lecture is to think about some of the threats to capitalism and some of the arguments that people raise against capitalism, and maybe just to remind ourselves about why those arguments are wrong, and to remind ourselves about the importance of liberty, which is really what all this is about. And my topic for today, South Africa's War Against Capitalism, is taken from the title of this book by Walter Williams called South Africa's War Against Capitalism. And this book was a study that he did on uh, the apartheid system in South Africa. So it was the late 1980s uh, when he went to South Africa and he wanted to study the arguments and uh, strategies of the apartheid government and to uh, think about the implications for capitalism, which is uh, a subject that was of great interest to Walter Williams. He was a great defender of free markets and a great defender of capitalism. So his main interest in uh, studying South Africa's war against capitalism was to think about what are the implications for capitalism of the apartheid system. Apartheid, for those of you who don't know, simply means uh, separate development. So the idea of the apartheid government was that we separate the races. They classified all the races, kept them separate, and said that each race will develop itself. Many people think that this is similar to the uh, American idea of separate but equal, but it wasn't similar to that at all. So the idea wasn't that each race will be equal, separate but equal. The idea was that each race is independent, develops itself. You know, so kind of uh, each man for his own community idea. That was uh, what Walter Williams wanted to study. Now, Walter Williams, for those who don't know, uh, was an economist. Uh, he was, uh, did his PhD in economics at UCLA spent, I think, a couple of years at Stanford. He was a great friend of Thomas Sowell, who's the uh, Chicago School economist, many of you will know. And after that, he went to George Mason University, where was, he was the J.M. Olin Distinguished Professor of Economics. He wrote a foreword to this great book. Some of you will know this book. It's called The Real Lincoln. We had a little bit about it uh, in our first lecture when we heard about uh, this president, Lincoln, and the war that he waged on the south of this country, and the way he tried to spin the reasons for that war as that he was doing it to emancipate oppressed people. That was the reason he gave, and I think we heard in the lecture that that wasn't really what that was about. So in uh, his foreword to this book, Walter Williams talks about the importance of liberty, and the importance of uh, self-determination, freedom of association and self-determination, and people's rights to determine their own destiny, and in the context of this book, the right of states to secede. And he talks about uh, the threats to the US Constitution that uh, were posed by uh, Lincoln's war. So, that just gives you, I think, a very good uh, idea of the man, Walter Williams, and the, the, his commitment to liberty, and also his ability to look incisively at what's happening in a country and to try and ascertain the real story behind what's going on and not just the spin that people are uh, giving or the justifications that people are giving for what they do but to look at what is the reality of what's going on in the country. So that's really what I want to talk about today. And uh, I have four main topics that I want to cover. The first is this uh, unholy alliance between the idea of anti-racism and anti-capitalism, because that's what we see uh, anti-racism being offered as a justification for people who really want to wage war on others. And I think that's what we can see in the, in the spin that we heard about uh, in relation to the war against the South, was people saying, oh, wouldn't it be really convenient if we say that this was a war of emancipation? Why? Because everybody supports emancipation. So if you say 
the reason we've done this is emancipation. Everybody's going to support you. Everybody's going to say, ah, you're the good people. And so that's the idea of anti-racism, is that it provides cover for many things that people want to do. Now, Walter Williams, interesting enough, really was against racism. He, he actually really was. When he spent time in the army, he was, uh, you know, constantly writing letters to his superiors, uh, telling them why segregating people in the army was wrong, right? He, he, he made them so fed up with his constant letter writing that they invited him to please leave the army. <laughs> Stop sending them constant letters. So he really was against uh, racism. What he didn't like was people saying that what they're doing is anti-racism as cover for whatever else it was that they happened to be doing. And Marxists and communists are notorious for this, as we shall see in, in a moment. So what they really are is against capitalism, although they present that as a war against racism. So I just want to show some of those links because we see them doing the same even today. Apartheid in camouflage is an idea that Walter Williams uh, wanted to warn people about, that the mere fact that the name apartheid is gone, which it is now, it's been, uh, the, the apartheid system collapsed in 1994 in South Africa, and Walter Williams is saying the mere fact that a scheme is not called apartheid doesn't mean that it isn't apartheid in substance. So that's his idea of apartheid in camouflage, and I'm going to argue today that this idea of equity and DEI, diversity, equity, inclusiveness, is apartheid in camouflage. And that's what I'm going to show you. And then I want to highlight the importance of freedom of association and to show that the real threat to capitalism doesn't come from the so-called racists, it comes from the state. And so that's another point that I want to emphasize because I want to show you that the harm that was caused by apartheid was not a harm caused by hateful people. It was a harm caused by the state. And as long as the state continues with its schemes, apartheid by some other name, we'll continue to see the harm that Walter Williams was arguing against in this book. So the first point I want to make is this idea that anti-racists put forward. They say capitalism is racist. And so they tell people the reason why you should be against capitalism is because capitalism is racist. It, it's a good argument for them because it works. They can say to people, do you want to be a racist? And people say, no, no, I don't want to be a racist. So then you have to be against capitalism. It works. People. People follow along because many people don't want to be bad people, and so that's why they do it. So they presented the war against apartheid in South Africa as a war on racism. So everybody said, yes, we get behind the war on racism. And they said, that is also a war on capitalism. So they, they're trying to conflate the two things. If you want to fight racism, you have to fight capitalism. And Williams uh, tells us, this is what he found when he went to South Africa, that the dominant black opinion in South Africa is that apartheid is an outgrowth of capitalism. So basically, they would be saying to people, if you want to get rid of apartheid, which they all did, then you need to get rid of capitalism. Business people are often seen as evil forces seeking racially discriminatory laws. So they were saying to people, the reason we have all these racially discriminatory laws is because the dirty capitalists, we heard about dirty capitalists yesterday, as I recall. They'll be saying the dirty capitalists want the racially discriminatory laws. That's why we've got these laws, which is not true, of course. And they said that the reason they do this is because they want to introduce economic exploitation of non-Europeans. And so in the eyes of many black Africans and their benefactors in Europe, the United States, and elsewhere, these are the liberals of the West who always support anti-capitalist uh, movements. Uh, they said, we need to promote socialist goals. And the reason they said we need to promote socialist goals is to end racism. So they promoted state ownership, income redistribution, and they said the reason they are doing this is to bring about a more just society. 
have the state controlling everything, and that way you can defeat racism. And so that's the uh, argument they presented to the West. Now, an interesting question is to ask, why would countries like the United States that are known to be uh, capitalist, why would they be supporting movements that say we're socialist, we want state ownership? So here's the, here's the paradox. The US president, Harry Truman, who was the president at the time that the Africana nationalists came to power, felt that he needed to support them because they were fighting the communists. So think, think about this for a minute. So for those of you who don't know, the Africana nationalists were the white minority South Africans. After the Second World War, they said the only way to defend ourselves, because they're only a small minority, numerically small minority, is to uh, take power, uh, take control of the state and make sure that the state will protect us. So that was their primary reason why they implemented apartheid. So this is the paradox that the US supported them because they were fighting against communists. And when I say fighting against communists, I mean that literally. They took up arms to fight um, mercenaries who were being funded by the Soviet Union at the time, trying to sp spread uh, communism in Africa. And so it was an actual war against communists and the US supported them because they were fighting the communists, right? So they said, well, we don't know if these people are anti-racist or racist, but we're supporting them because they're fighting the communists. So despite supporting civil rights within the United States, the Truman administration thought that the nationalist government in South Africa would be their ally against the Soviet Union and to help them to fight against the Soviet Union. So there was just one problem with uh, this idea of supporting anti-racism, which actually was quite controversial in the United States. Some of you may know that eventually the West imposed economic sanctions on South Africa. That's because the Soviet Union collapsed and they decided we have no excuse anymore to say no to opposing the apartheid regime in South Africa, which was said to be uh, a racist regime. So they said, well, okay, what's our reason for not sanctioning them now that the communist threat has receded? So that was the argument. And the Black Caucus in Congress had a big push to impose economic sanctions on South Africa. President uh, Ronald Reagan was uh, the president at the time and Margaret Thatcher, was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom at the time, and the two of them were great friends, and they were strong defenders of capitalism as they understood it to be. Mrs. Thatcher used to carry uh, a copy of Hayek's The Road to Serfdom in her bag around with her. We're not sure whether she ever read it <laughs> or understood it, because she was more of a neocon. But anyway, she carried the book in her bag, and uh, that's the way that she and uh, President Reagan understood themselves. And so they did not want to fight the apartheid regime because the apartheid regime, they thought, supporting them, they thought, was better than supporting the commies. So here's the problem, as you can see. Uh, for those who don't know, the man standing there in the middle is uh, Nelson Mandela, the great uh, anti-apartheid hero with his fist up, standing in front of, for those of you who don't know, that's the communist, uh, the Marxist, uh, hammer and sickle. Next to him is his wife, Mrs. Mandela, his wife at the time, uh, Mrs. Mandela, who was also a militant communist. Uh, when I say militant, I mean that Mrs. Thatcher regarded her as a terrorist, which is why she didn't want to support them. And standing next to them is their lawyer, Joe Slovo, who was also, coincidentally, at least the New York Times said it was coincidence, he was coincidentally one of the leaders of the South African Communist Party. So these are real commies, as I think most people can tell. But the New York Times ran this thing where they said, oh, they're not really communist. They're just communist adjacent. You know, they have, they, the New York Times said, you know, Mandela is not a communist. He's just loyal to his friends and his friends happen to be communists. 
but we shouldn't worry too much about that because what we should really focus on is his loyalty towards his friends. They were helping him uh, in the anti-apartheid uh, movement, helping him with weapons, blowing things up, and all these other kinds of things that Mrs. Thatcher didn't think she should be supporting. And so that's why uh, Ronald Reagan vetoed sanctions against South Africa. He said, no, we're not sanctioning them because they're fighting the commies and we don't like the commies. And as uh, those of you who know the history will know that his veto was overruled by Congress. Why did they overrule his veto? They said, look, forget whether these people are commies or not. That's beside the point. What's important is that they're anti-racists. And so this is the point that I was trying to, uh, to tell you, that when people uh, cover themselves in a mantle of anti-racism, they get away with communism, terrorism, and even worse, because people think, oh, we should support them. They're fighting against racism. So uh, Walter Williams wanted to, uh, he wasn't too much interested in the politics of it. He wanted to show that what the apartheid state was doing was nothing to do with capitalism per se. And he had another goal, which was to show that capitalism, far from being the enemy, was the reason that the apartheid system was dismantling. The apartheid system was introduced in 1948, and by 1986 or 7, when Walter Williams was doing his study, it was already unraveling. It started unraveling in the 1970s already, and he wanted to show that the reason apartheid was unraveling was because of capitalism, because of the free market, and making people realize that this apartheid system wasn't worth uh, promoting. So he wanted to show what capitalism is and why capitalism is the source of freedom and the reason that uh, the apartheid system was unraveling. Part of the problem here was definitional. When people say capitalism is racist, Partly it's because they don't know what capitalism is. And that's why I think it's really important for you uh, from the lectures uh, that you heard yesterday from uh, Dr. Rittenauer was telling you what capitalism is, what capital goods are. When you understand what capitalism is, nobody can fool you by telling you, oh, this person's been really nasty to me and that's capitalism because you know what capitalism is and you can see that it's nothing to do with that. And so this is one of the points that Walter Williams wanted to make. So this is a quote from the Folks Handle, which is a magazine of the uh, Africana nationalists who are saying they don't like capitalism. So people accused them of implementing apartheid because they are capitalists, but in fact, they weren't capitalists at all. They were statists, and the reason they supported the state was because they thought the state would keep them safe, being a, a racial minority in South Africa. And look at what they say about capitalism. They say they're sick of it. In fact, they thought their main threat came from capitalism. They didn't see capitalism as a friend. They saw capitalism as the enemy. They said they didn't like its soul-destroying materialism. So the way they saw it, they were not capitalists at all. They were farmers. And their main reason, they've been in South Africa since uh, 1652, and their main reason for being there was farming. They saw the land as farmland, and they, uh, they're into conservation, wildlife conservation, commercial farming. That's their interest, and they saw it as their home. And actually, they thought they were under threat from investors and capitalists, as they saw it, who wanted to come and exploit uh, the mining potential, mining gold, diamonds, and all these other things. And they said, well, those people are threatening us. That's what they mean when they say they're sick of capitalism with its soul-destroying materialism. So Walter Williams is trying to say, far from these people being capitalists, they themselves are at war against capitalism. And their apartheid system itself is a war against capitalism. And he thought if they understood what capitalism meant, they would find it, uh, they would see that capitalism was actually their salvation and not a threat to them. Also interesting in Walter Williams' study 
is that apartheid, when it was introduced, it was, if you read the justifications for apartheid, it's like reading the justifications for DEI. And that's why I was saying the two of them are very similar. They had very good intentions. They had liberal intentions. And here Williams quotes a judge who said it was the, the idea of separate development wasn't intended to exploit anybody. It wasn't intended as an injustice. If anything, it was seen as honestly and positively the best way to protect the white minority, yes, who were their own people, the Africaners, but also the only way to save the Bantu. And Walter Williams has many, many documents showing that this was the case, that liberals, it's always liberals with their schemes. You know, like, oh, here's how we can help everyone. Here's how, you know, we'll, we'll have this like social engineering and we'll go in there and we, we will separate everyone and that's gonna be fantastic because everyone's going to be very happy. And he shows that that's what actually was going on uh, with apartheid. They had the best of intentions. In fact, it was a complete failure. And Williams argues that apartheid is not, not only is it not capitalism, it is the antithesis of capitalism. Apartheid is a pervasive system of legalized racial discrimination. It's not capitalism at all. It is a legalized racial discrimination. And the only way that you can unravel that is through market forces. And he shows this as well, that market forces chipped away at legal discrimination. So just to give an example, you would have a law that says, if you're white, you're not allowed to sell your house to a black person or an Indian person or anyone. You can only sell to another white person. So here you'd have a white person trying to sell their home and the only people who can afford to buy are not white people. And in the end they say, well, I wanna sell it. So they just sell it anyway in breach of the law. Or same thing with people going onto a segregated train uh, which, where some of the carriages are whites only and some of the carriages are blacks only. And the white carriages or the black carriages, whatever the race of the passenger, are already full. So it's either don't go on your journey or get in the carriage for the other race that's not your race. And if you're really in a hurry, you just think, well, you know, I just got to get on the train. So it was already being unraveled by people simply ignoring it. People tell stories about going to the beach so the beach had signs that says whites on this space of the beach and blacks on this space of the beach. And everyone shows up to the beach and they're so excited. They're not looking for the signs, like which part of the beach am I supposed to be? And it was unraveling because of people ignoring it. Or sitting on benches, that's another one that people like talking about. The bench says whites only or blacks only, or whatever it says, and you're tired so you sit without thinking which bench, whose bench is this I'm sitting on. So that was the idea, and you can see this also reflected in uh, William Hutt's work. So William Hutt was a British South African who uh, was at the University of Cape Town for many years, and he also said the same thing, that the free market is colorblind and race blind, and as long as you're supporting the free market, nobody has time to worry about uh, enforcing these rules of apartheid. It's important to remember that enforcing apartheid rules was extremely expensive, costly, and time consuming. So just imagine something like a church. You're allowed to have any race come to your church, and you're allowed to have events for the people who come to your church, but you're not allowed to have, you were not allowed in the apartheid era to have black and white people in the same room so you would have to have an event and then have different rooms for people who are attending the same event. And so it was under huge pressure because you didn't have enough police to go to all the churches on a Sunday to make sure nobody's mixing in the same room. So it comes under huge uh, logistical pressure and that's what William Hutt is saying there. And so one of the uh, aims of Walter Williams was to show how liberty unravels apartheid. And as long as you promote liberty, you will see apartheid unraveling. He says long before the international climate made apartheid an untenable 
proposition, South Africa's legalized system of racial discrimination was already under attack from within, as I've just been explaining. Now, a small part of that, you could say, was due to the anti-apartheid activists who are saying, you know, the commies that I showed you earlier, who are saying this is wrong, this is immoral, you shouldn't be doing this, and liberals and free market supporters saying you shouldn't do this because it's wrong. But a much larger part of the battle was waged not out of good motives or altruism or moral, you know, to be decent or the brotherhood of man, but on economic grounds, where the stakes were profits and losses. People who were, just to give another example, employers who were told they can only hire white people in their workplace, they needed people to do the work. So in the end, they'll say, we don't care about the rules. We'll hire whoever can do the work. We'll promote whoever's doing good work without regard to what the law was telling them they're supposed to do. And that's why William says, liberty unravels apartheid. So by the same token, because I want to link this to what's going on today with this idea of equity and DEI, we would expect liberty to be incompatible with the idea of equity. And the more we promote liberty, the more we will see uh, DEI unraveling. To realize apartheid ideology requires inefficient resource allocation. Some producers and consumers are forced to choose costlier patterns of production and consumption. The fact that people seek wealth maximization implies a tendency towards least cost behaviors. And so apartheid laws are bound to encounter strong market force resistance. That's what Williams expected to find. That was his premise. And that is, in fact, what he found when he went to South Africa. And now let's think about equity, apartheid's successor. Despite castigating race discrimination as capitalism, as they did in South Africa when they said, let's get rid of apartheid because it's capitalism, the same people, the same opponents of apartheid, who are self-confessed supporters of communism, I showed you uh, them earlier, you know, standing under the hammer and sickle. Suddenly, they've done a complete about turn, and now they're enthusiastic supporters of race discrimination. How can that be? Supposedly, they were against apartheid because it was racial discrimination, but now they're very much in front of race discrimination. And so this is my argument, that equity is just apartheid, but with the races reversed. So what they're saying is, Apartheid was wrong because whites were oppressing blacks. But equity, that's very good because now the blacks are oppressing the whites. That's their argument. You flip the races and suddenly it becomes a good thing. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, that doesn't make any sense at all. That's illogical. It makes sense in the twisted logic of an ideology called critical race theory. Right? And that's, it's an ideology which explains why something that's wrong when it's done by white people, if you flip it and now it's done by black people, it becomes very good. That's actually what the whole theory is there to justify. And they have, they have books and peer-reviewed papers all explaining that if you flip the races, it becomes perfectly justified. So that's the way that they do it. And Will, uh, Williams wanted to show that apartheid is not capitalism. That'll be obvious to you because you know what capitalism is. But he also wanted to show that capitalism erodes racism. And he was against apartheid in all its forms, including uh, apartheid in camouflage. So one striking feature of William's analysis is that he's warning us to be cautious about apartheid in camouflage. He is not one of those people that says, just look at the label, and if it says apartheid, that means it's bad, and if it says equity, that means it's good. It's exactly the same thing. It is apartheid in camouflage, and he warns that we should be on the lookout for a pervasive system of legalized racial discrimination by whatever name called. You know, commies are very good at giving good labels to their schemes. So they'll call it, they'll have a pervasive system of legalized racial discrimination and call it social justice. 
And then you'll say, oh, social justice, so oh, that's great because I support that. And Williams is saying, well, look at, look at the content, look at what it is that they're imposing. And if it's a system of legalized racial discrimination, it's wrong. Now we know that DEI is also a pervasive system of legalized racial discrimination, as I'll show you in a moment. And Williams is warning that all of Africa's post-colonial experience should have taught us this lesson, if no other lesson. You should always ask when you eliminate oppression, what is going to take its place? You don't want to get rid of one form of oppression only to introduce an even worse form of oppression. And I have argued that I think the new form of apartheid, so-called equity, is worse than the old form of apartheid. It is worse for many reasons. First, because now you have a majority oppressing a minority. That's going to be bad anyway, because if you're oppressed as are a numerical minority, you can avoid them. But if they're a numerical majority, you aren't going to be able to avoid them. And it's worse for many other reasons. For instance, uh, actively locking people out of opportunities. So the old apartheid was very, uh, oddly enough, very laissez-faire. They said, we look after ourselves and you look after yourselves and you know, we'll care about our families, you go care about your family. But this new form of apartheid is worse because it's saying, you have to look after us you know, it's payback for how mean you were in the, you know, historically. You have to look after us and we won't let you look after yourselves because we'll exclude you from jobs, education, and we're going to expropriate your uh, property. They've now got this law called expropriation without compensation, where they say that the state can seize your property for any reason and they don't have to pay. And this is why I say it's actually worse than the old system, which at least left you to fend for yourself as best you could. And so that's why I think that we ought to be uh, against it. How do we recognize it? We look for restrictions achieved when one class of individuals acquires privilege through the use of state violence. Through the use of state violence, that just means the law. People often forget that law is backed by state violence. It's backed by state force. Laws are not optional. Laws are not suggestions for what you should maybe be doing, because if you don't follow the law, the state enforces that against you. So using state violence to deny another class of individuals the right to engage in voluntary and mutually agreeable exchanges, where the restrictive criterion is race. If you do that, that is apartheid by any name called. And now let's look at what equity does and measure it against that test. Let's look at equity in the United States and see how it echoes that restrictions based on race that we see in uh, apartheid. This is an example from the current administration, uh, the Biden administration. This is one of Mr. Biden's executive orders. So as you know, President Biden is a great supporter of DEI. He wants to roll out equity everywhere. He says that he's going to advance equity for all, including people of color and others who have been historically underserved. If you are not a person of color and you can't show you've been historically underserved, marginalized, adversely affected by persistent poverty, inequality, this policy isn't supporting you. So that's what he's saying. He's affirmatively advancing what he calls equity, civil rights, racial justice, and equal opportunity. Now look at those words that I put in bold type, because I want to suggest to you that you should not be beguiled by words. Oh, they've called it equal opportunities. Oh, that's great. That means it's good because I'm in favor of equal opportunities. That's what I'm trying to warn you against. You have to look at the substance of what is being done. Don't just say, oh, they've called it racial justice and therefore it's good, but look at what is being done. They've championed what they call racial equity. They call this equal opportunity. I will say this to you, the reason why they call it equal opportunity is not because it is, 
but because that's the wording used in the Civil Rights Act. The Civil Rights Act says we're here to support equal opportunities. So if they call whatever apartheid they're doing, if they call it equal opportunities, people are fooled by that because they say, oh yeah, we're allowed to do this under the Civil Rights Act. Phony civil rights, I should say, as Murray Rothbard often uh, called them. So they're saying they're promoting equal opportunity through landmark legislation. So they've got, these are just examples of the legislation they've enacted that I'm calling apartheid in everything but name. They've got an American rescue plan, a bipartisan infrastructure law, you know, Inflation Reduction Act, you know, and they, they pass all these laws and then they say, you've probably heard, it has a particular impact on, you know, racialized minorities. So those are the people that we really want to protect. 90 agencies across the federal government enforcing these laws. And I just wanted to give you an example of a bipartisan measure. The reason why I wanted to choose an example of a bipartisan measure is because I don't want you to think, oh, it's only the Dems, the Democrats who do this. Because you think, well, you expect that from them. They're socialists anyway. They're going to support DEI. And I wanted to alert you that the Republicans do exactly the same thing, primarily because they are beguiled by words. So if you say it's, it's equal opportunities, they're right behind that. And this is what I'm trying to warn you against. So look at this Digital Equity Act. This is a bipartisan measure supported by the Democrats and the Republicans. Why? Just look at the nice sounding words to ensure that all individuals and communities have the full skills, technology, and capacity needed to reap the full benefits of our digital economy. Wow, great. You know, everyone wants to get behind that. Then they've got a list there of people that will be benefited, low-income households, aging populations, ethnic minorities. They've set aside $2.75 billion for this. So if you don't fit in those groups, and there have been a lot of lawsuits about this, because essentially, not to put too fine a point upon it, it excludes white men. That's what it is. And there have been a lot of lawsuits, lawsuits about this. So what's it essentially saying? 2.5 billion, you're going to have to contribute to the payment of that, but you aren't going to benefit from this digital equity scheme. And that's just one example. You could choose many other examples across the board, and this is what many people are now getting uh, angry about, I think is, it would be a good way to express it. And that's why I was saying it is the new apartheid. Walter Williams says, don't be beguiled by labels. He says, one might imagine many other camouflages that apartheid could assume, but what they have in common is that they take the form of government regulation of some aspect of the business and labor markets with explicit or implicit racial regulations. Not only is the government trying to regulate business and labor, but they're doing so based on race. And that's what he's calling uh, apartheid in camouflage. Now look at what it looks like in South Africa. The law says we're going to advance economic transformation of black people. It states that in the law, it says black people. It defines black people to include African colored and Indian people. That is everyone except the white minority. Then it says all these people are entitled to full and equal enjoyment. Full and equal, that's equity. Equity is where they're saying real equality. Then it says housing, healthcare, food, water, social security, that's everything. Recently, those who follow the news may have seen attempts to regulate access to water, saying water is for black people. And if you're white, I don't know, find a way to survive and persist without water. And then they say it's constitutional. That's how they can argue that it's constitutional because they say it's full and equal enjoyment and we're promoting the economic participation of uh, black people. They have a specific law for this. It's called the Broad-Based Black Economic Empowerment Act. So when people tell you, oh, but you, denying people access to water is illegal. No, it's not illegal. The Black Whatever Empowerment Act says they can do that. And whites who are 7% of the population are completely left out of the legal system. 
that is the law of equity. And my argument is that it's exactly like the old law of apartheid that supposedly they were against. So look at an example of an apartheid law. The Mines and Works Act of 1911 specified the ratio of blacks to whites that should be found in any mine because the idea that they had was that you get blacks doing the manual labor and then you get a white foreman who's overseeing all the work. And they specified the ratio, 10.5 blacks to one white, which later uh, was uh, changed to 3.5 blacks to one white. And they monitor the mines to make sure you've got the correct number of racial categories. So that was the old apartheid that supposedly is gone. But look at the new equity. A law called the Employment Equity Act specified the percentage of blacks that have to be in your business in order to qualify for a license. And they license everything. So the water restrictions I was talking about earlier, that's based on licenses. You need a license to have access to water. And in order to get a license, you have to be black. So if you're not black, well, too bad. That's the way that it functions. Licenses for water, sale of medicines. If you want to sell medicines, you have to show that you're black or you have 30% ownership of black. So I'm just giving the example of 30%, but you'd have to look at the law to see what percentage of blacks is uh, required. Percentage of blacks flying your planes. Never mind whether the pilot can fly a plane. What matters is the pilot's race because you need those racial quotas of the people who are flying your planes. They actually do this for real. It isn't even just theoretical. They do this uh, for real. So recently, uh, Elon Musk, he's been supplying uh, the internet across Africa, everywhere except South Africa, because they said, yeah, so if you want to do business in South Africa, you have to half your business, you have to give it to black people. And he said, no. So that's it. That's the way that it functions. The law also defines what is meant by all these races. So it tells, the apartheid law told us what is meant by white. That means a person who in appearance is obviously a white person. Now it tells us who is black, which it basically defines as everybody except whites. And Williams's point is that this is wrong. Stop trying to regulate how the races are mixing. In any society, people should have the right to associate with whom they will. And that's the point that William Hutt is making there. You have a right to restrict the membership of a private club. And you also have the right to admit whoever you want. Nobody has a right to tell you anything based on what race uh, people are. And he, uh, William Hutt is also saying that it is a mutual liberty. It is a mutual liberty that applies to your right to associate with people and also to your right not to associate with people. And you can see the same idea here with Chamberlain saying, liberty is important and that's why forced segregation is wrong. But forced integration is also wrong. So apartheid was wrong because it forced segregation, and equity is wrong because it forces integration. Both of them are wrong. And I think what Williams has successfully shown here is the state behind this, the predatory state. And he gives lots of examples of state violence, which is basically the fact that I was just showing where you can find each of these provisions in the law. They're not just government policies, but they're actually the law. And I've got lots of examples there. So just to conclude, I want to conclude with some words about the importance of liberty. The importance of private property rights, free markets, freedom of association, and contractual freedom. Your priority should not be, is this promoting equality? Is this promoting inequality? But your priority should be, is this promoting liberty? Is this protecting property rights? The state should have no role in enforcing economic progress. That is not the job of the state. That's why we have free markets. And we don't say, well, it'll, it'll work better if the state does it. Because if you try to do that, which is what the apartheid state tried to do, you fail. 
And we saw that failure, it was epic. And the same applies to enforcing diversity, equity, and inclusiveness. It is wrong for the same reasons that uh, apartheid was wrong. And I just want to finish with the words of Murray Rothbard. Because I think sometimes it's easy to get uh, lost in the weeds and the details and to forget why we're here and to forget what this is all about. And we forget why we support free markets. We forget why we support capitalism. We don't support free markets just because they can make us wealthy, although they can, but that's not the reason why we support free markets. That's not the reason why we support capitalism. We support these uh, principles of economics because they are the only principle, principles of economics that will lead to liberty. And liberty, Rothbard says, is a moral principle. I think it's really important to remember that. It is grounded in the nature of man. In particular, liberty is a theory of justice. We are not people who don't care about justice because all we care about is free markets. We support free markets because liberty is a theory of justice and this is the only way to promote justice and to promote the abolition of aggressive violence in the affairs of men. Aggressive violence, whether it's trying to force people apart as apartheid did, or whether it's trying to force people together as equity does. Thank you.